three on the fourth floor. Come a bit early and make your coffee or tea and we'll have coffee and tea while we study the word together. But we want to finish up this morning with uh, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. We got almost all the way through on April 1st um, and it became for us, it was, a, uh, it was an, an Easter message, a Resurrection Sunday message. And surprise, surprise, here we are, water baptism, very, very shortly, and now we have a water baptism message. I think maybe the Lord arranged this, that's what I think. But we finished the story today. Um, we'll go just a little bit beyond one o'clock, but I promise I'll keep it very short. Um, so take a look at your watches. This will be the shortest message I've ever given on a Sunday morning. As you remember, Philip was in the midst of a great revival up in Samaria, even though it says he went down to Samaria because of the altitude of Jerusalem. It always says down, but he was up in Samaria. And I want to ask you this morning, we're going to look at a few scriptures, and I want to just talk for just a minute about how God leads us and how God directs us and then how we respond. So Philip makes it up to the city in Samaria, and there's a huge revival there. And my question to you this morning is this. If you've got your Bibles, you can look. We'll look at some scriptures in just a minute. Did the Holy Spirit, is it recorded in the Bible that the Holy Spirit told Philip, now, go this way, this way, and this way, and go up to Samaria. And there, I will pour out my spirit. There will be a great revival. Many will believe. Many will be baptized. Great miracles will be worked. Is that how the Holy Spirit led Philip? No, it's not. What we see in this first part is that it seems that the Holy Spirit leads Philip through circumstances, doesn't he? As he often does. Um, I, it, this doesn't sound exactly right, but it was circumstantial guidance, if you will, if you want to think of it in that way. And then as he is, seems to be in the midst of revival still, the Holy Spirit then leads in another way. And in this second guidance that we see, the Holy Spirit is very specific and it's very supernatural and it's very clear. And the Holy Spirit says, get up and go to a desert road. Doesn't tell him why, doesn't seem to even tell him exactly where, except get up and go to this desert road. And so we have something that is much more supernatural, if you will, in, in guidance. So let's look at these two scriptures. It's all in chapter eight. So the first part is verse four and five. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. Remember this word, this phrase, they preach the word. It's not what I'm doing this morning. It means by how you live and just by how you talk in your conversation. It sh this should describe what you and I are doing and saying and being as Christians day by day where we are. This, this should be us. And so as they go, they're preaching the word. They're sharing about Jesus. And then it says, Philip went down to a city in Samaria. There's no, there doesn't seem to be any specific Holy Spirit guidance for Philip to do that. He was just scattered by the persecution. But would you agree that it was the guidance of the Holy Spirit that brought him to this city in Samaria? I think all of us would agree that. We look at the results. We look at what happened. We look at the overall picture. And we see that God was doing something. So here we see on one hand a certain type of guidance as the Holy Spirit just guides through circumstances. And then we see the other type of guidance also very, uh, but much more specific and much more supernatural, right? And what I want us to see this morning is this. Both of these are the Holy Spirit. Both are the Holy Spirit. Um, one is not less Holy Spirit. One is not more Holy Spirit. And depend, but depending on our personalities, depending on our character, some of us prefer this way. Maybe we're more practical types and, and to hear something about, oh, the Holy Spirit told me to, the Holy Spirit led me to. We don't even like to hear that very much, right? It's kind of like, oh, come on. Don't, don't talk that way. Some of us really are that way. And then others of us are, uh, are, are very much, come on, you need to be more spiritual. The Holy Spirit leads and guides us. And the Holy Spirit led me to do this and led me to do, to do that. As we look at these two, as we look at these two uh, situations, 
this morning, both in the life of Philip, and when we look at the response and the result of both of these, we should be encouraged this morning that God leads us in both ways. So don't, depending on your personality or your character, don't discount one of these ways. If it's not your way, if it's not your personality, let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit in your life and let Him lead you as, you, as He will, but you be obedient and you be sensitive uh, and that's, that's one of the great things about Philip. We see that Philip is really obedient. As I was thinking about this, and as I was finishing up and preparing yesterday, I thought about this verse 26 specifically, and I told this story in the first, um, in the first service, and I want to tell you again very briefly. Uh, many years ago, uh, there was a, a, she's in heaven now, but a, a godly, godly woman, you've heard mom and dad talk about her before, uh, Hattie Hammond. Um, and uh, she and two or three others were the greatest spir spiritual influence in my mother's life and in dad's life as well. And Sister Hattie was from Hagerstown, Maryland. Can you believe there's somebody in Lighthouse today here in Hong Kong who's also from Hagerstown? Who would that be? Pretty much. Miss Julie, right back there, right close. Let me do close. How many miles, Miss Julie? 20, 20 miles, close enough. <laughs> Halfway around the world, close, close enough. And Hagerstown, by bus in those days, it was four or five hours by bus. Uh, and Sister Hattie, godly woman, a Bible teacher, did not drive, but listened carefully to the voice of the Lord. God used her in wonderful ways. And one weekday, she woke up, she got up, was going about the things in her house, and she said the Holy Spirit spoke to her, led her, whatever words you want to use. It was a supernatural guidance. It wasn't just circumstance, and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go down, buy a bus ticket, and I want you to go to Washington, D.C. this morning. And Sister Hattie, who's very obedient to the Lord, nevertheless said, but God, I don't need to go to Washington, D.C. And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go to Washington, D.C. Go get a bus ticket. And so she said, okay, Holy Spirit, I'll go. Went down to the bus station, bought her ticket, got on the bus, and the bus started off. I think it was the very first stop after the beginning. A man got on the bus. There were many seats all over the bus, but he got on and he chose to sit down right next to Sister Hammond. Right next to, I mean, literally right there. Now me, I'm sorry, you know, I'm not so spiritual. I kind of think, give me space, I like my own space. But he sat down next to her and as the bus started off, he turned and he looked at her and he said, can you tell me how to become a Christian? <laughs> Boom, just true story. True story. Can you tell me how to become a Christian? And that reminds me so much of this because Philip goes on the desert road and then there's a, there's a chariot and the Holy Spirit says, go up by that chariot. He goes up and it's pretty much the same thing, right? Philip says, can you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I understand unless somebody guides me, unless somebody explains to me? And so Sister Hattie, for those four or so hours on the bus all the way to Washington, D.C., told this man, about Jesus and how to become a Christian. She led him to the Lord. His life was a mess. It was falling apart. His marriage was broken, but she led him to the Lord and she got in touch with him later and found out he had led his wife to the Lord. The family was restored. The marriage was restored. All part of God's plan. And as I was thinking about that and I was thinking about Philip, I thought, I believe, I believe that the Holy Spirit is really longing for and looking for people who will be obedient to Him, who will be quickly obedient. And I want to be such a person, don't you? I want to be such a person. He's looking for those that will listen to His voice and just obey and take a step. And it may not always be the most logical step. It may not always make a lot of sense. But as we obey and do what He says to do, He can do wonderful things. He truly can. But He works through people. He works through people. And He wants to work through us. And if God has ever used you, if He has led you and guided you, and He's used you to help somebody else and to bless somebody else, wouldn't you say that there are few greater joys than being used by the Lord to bless somebody? Is that not true? It tr oh, it is. What joy there is. And it's not praise to us or praise to me. Oh, look, I did this because it's so clearly God did it, right? God did it. And so that's what we, that's in the story I just told you. And that's what we see with Philip as well. And so he gets up in the, in, the, uh, in the chariot. They're going along. He explains Isaiah, the passage, which is a messianic 
passage and uh, about Jesus. And then I want us to see what comes next. Um, Acts 8, 36 through 39. And let's see what it says. So, and I'm just going to read part of it. 37 is not included here. Uh, but your Bibles may have it. That's because uh, th verse 37 is um, the, the eunuch says, is there anything you know, can, that should keep me from being baptized? And Philip said, well, if you believe. And the eunuch says, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So your very earliest scriptures don't include that verse, but many, many other fragments of scripture do include that. So uh, generally people accept that it is consistent with what happened. But anyhow. So as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What would keep me from being baptized? Now, what type of water? We have no idea. Um, it may have been a stream. It may have been a creek. It may have been a little river. But after all, it was the desert. So a lot of Bible teachers believe it was probably some sort of oasis in the, in the, middle, of the, in the middle of the desert. And what I want us to see is this in the very short time we have this morning, because um, I wanted to get to this in a few other scriptures. He looks at the water. He has been listening. And obviously, at some point, salvation has come. He has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And his question is, as Francis Chan pretty much said this morning, what would keep me from being baptized? Depending on the Bible translation you have, uh, it might be, why shouldn't I be baptized? Um, it might be, uh, why can't I be baptized? Is there anything to keep me from being baptized? Which is pretty much what is said here. So I want us just to camp on that for just a minute. And that's a question for us as well, since we're looking ahead at water baptism. What would keep me from being baptized? Well, in the case of the eunuch, nothing would keep him from being baptized. There was nothing because he was baptized. It says, uh, and he gave the orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. We'll finish up with that in just a minute. So, obviously, there was nothing to keep him from being baptized. How much did he know? I don't think he knew a lot, did he? How many classes did he have? Well, he had an on-the-spot class while they were going along in the chariot. Had he ever seen Jesus? No. Had he ever attended a Christian service? No, he had not. But he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and his question was the perfect question. Is there anything to keep me from being baptized? And the answer is no, there was nothing to keep, me, keep him from being baptized. And so my question to, to us this morning also is this. Is there anything to keep us from being baptized? Me, I can only think of, since we're adults here this morning, now sometimes it's a little bit different if you have a very young person, but to me, and you may think of other things, I can, I can think of only two things that would keep us from being baptized. I really mean this. Only two, you say only two? Only two. Number one is if you are not yet born again. Uh, if Jesus does not yet live in your heart, if you have not yet said, Jesus, I believe in you as my salvation, as the Lord of my life, take my sins, I receive your sacrifice for my sins, wash me clean, I give you my life, I will follow you, I am yours, then you're a child of God. Um, and if you haven't yet done that, then you shouldn't be baptized in water. Because baptizing in water is what takes place outside after something has taken place inside, right? And that's very simple, and we'll talk about that next week, whichever one of the pastors meets with you. But just, and we know this so well, but, and for those of you that say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, we've heard this before, but some haven't, so we're in this together. So that's one reason not to be water baptized. There's only one other reason not to be water baptized, and that is if you are a Christian, but you are living in deliberate sin, deliberate chosen sin. I'm not talking about struggling with sin and your, your God is helping you, but you still fail and fall in certain areas. I don't mean that at all, at all. But I do mean that you are a Christian, but you have chosen, I'm going to live the way I want. I am not going to give up I'm, this thing. I'm going to keep on living that way. And if so, then that's something that I think would keep you from being water baptized. Why? Because water baptism is a very clear line in our lives. My old life was that way. My new life is this way. And we're going to look at some scriptures in just a minute, um, just very briefly as we come to a close. I'm, we're okay. We still, we, we've got a few more minutes. But I, this is important. Um, 
Th but that's so clear. And those of us that have been water baptized, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of putting some pressure on this because I want us to remember the commitment that we also made when we were water baptized. Because sometimes, let's be honest, we kind of forget, don't we? When we've been Christians for a while, we get complacent about it. And we kind of go back into some of the ways that we used to, the, some of the ways we used to live. So we're going to look at some scriptures very quickly. But the eunuch says, is there anything that, should, that keeps me? Why shouldn't I be? And there was no reason not to. There was no reason not to. And then, so he, both Philip and the eunuch, okay, sorry, those of you that have been sprinkled, got to tell you this, okay. We look at verse 38. Then both Philip and the eunuch went, what? Say it with me. Down into the water. Okay. Sorry. I was going to drink this, but you tell me. Okay, so I just sprinkled water. Okay. You tell me how I can go down into that. Can't do it, right? And then the verse that ends says, and then they came up out of the water. You tell me, you tell me how I can come up out of, the, out of that. Can't do it, right? Can't, I still want to drink that, but anyhow. Here we go. Okay. Can't do it can't do it. Why do I stress that again? Because of what baptism means. And we're going to look at just a minute. And then Philip baptized him and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. And I want you to look at this phrase here just very briefly. What I love about this is it is a reminder. He went on his way rejoicing. It is a reminder to those of us who have been water baptized before and have been saved for a while of the joy of our salvation, truly of the joy of our salvation. And if you feel, if you are a Christian, but you have lost the joy of your salvation, I challenge you and I encourage you to go back to the Lord again, not for all the things that you can do for Him, not for all the service you can give Him, although service and work for the Lord is part of the Christian life, but it comes out of love, not out of duty. Those of you in the morning class, you studied the Church of Ephesus. This afternoon, we're going to study the Church of Ephesus. A, a church with great doctrine, a church with great works, but they lost their first love. And God wants our love more than He wants our works. He does, because He knows if He has our hearts and our love, work for Him, service for Him will flow out of that with joy, with joy. And we can come back to that as we spend time with Him. Not even praying for, God do this, God do that, but just time with Him. I'm so thankful for, it. for me in the last six or seven months. I'm not boasting, I'm just sharing with you. I have tried to set aside more time just to be with the Lord. There are the specific things I've been praying about, but just spending time with Him. And the Lord has really restored my heart and my joy just my love for him just my love for him it doesn't mean that i haven't gone through some hard things and some hard, and some problems and things but he's restored my love and my joy and that that has helped me to go through things and it helps each one of us too the eunuch went on his way rejoicing and i want us to look very quickly in the short time that we have and maybe the two or three minutes that we have left i want us to look at this verse uh next just to remind you from romans 6 3 through 14 because if you're going to be baptized this is you if you have been baptized, this was you. And if it's not, it can be and should be again. Okay? Let me read, and you can read along if you want to. Don't you remember... You, yeah, you can read if you, if you want to. Feel free to read aloud. That's fine. Don't you remember that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined Him in His death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. That's the picture of all the way in the water and all the way out, right? Okay, and then next. Since we have been united with Him in His death, we will also be raised to life as He was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Okay, we are no longer slaves to sin. 
So if you have gotten back into slavery in sin, let the Lord set you free. Amen? And remember the commitment that you made. And remember the commitment that the Lord Jesus made to you when you were saved and when you were water baptized. Verse 7, For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with Him. Now there's much more, but we're going to have to stop there uh, with that verse because of time. Then we're going to end with the uh, we're going to end with the transportation upgrade. But I want to remind you of this. So if you've been water baptized before and you've gotten complacent and you've gotten stuck in sin again. You go back and meditate on this and ask the Lord to speak this again to your life. And as we have the water baptism, we will invite you to recommit your life and rededicate your life to Him. You don't need to be water baptized again, but you can go back again and say, Lord, restore my first love. Lord, I'm reminded of that. And I stand again in my commitment to you. And I receive again your commitment to me. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then, very quickly, the close. This was my favorite ending as a kid, I told you. This is one of my favorite ones because I've always wanted an upgrade in transportation and I haven't had many of them. Um, I've had a few little small ones. I've never had an upgrade like this. Let's look at the very last slide. And so as when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. If you look at 1 Thessalonians 4.17, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, this is the same word. Suddenly took, suddenly took away. That is the word it means to snatch up or to catch up. And those of you that know about the doctrine of the rapture of the church, when Jesus takes us away, it's exactly the same word. Same word. Same word. Um, the way the rapture suddenly to be taken away. And that's the word that's used here. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And I love that because the eunuch is not saying, Whoo, buddy, you should have seen that miracle that happened. Came up out of the water and suddenly, poof, Philip disappeared. You and I, unfortunately, might be chat chatting about that. The eunuch is rejoicing about something else. He's rejoicing about salvation. He's rejoicing. And that's always the greatest miracle. Always the greatest miracle from death to life, from hopelessness to hope, from darkness to light. Hallelujah. From hell to heaven. Amen? Amen. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. One other reminder, obedience brings joy. Amen. Obedience brings joy. Philip, however, found himself at Azotus, or Azotus, it's sometimes called. So they were over here on the desert road, suddenly, as some translations say, Philip found himself on the streets of Azotus. Um, so he's just there. He's just there. Why does the Holy Spirit do it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I think in part it shows the Holy Spirit was in charge of all of this. It shows in part the human side of God's work. Philip had to walk all the way down to that desert road. Yeah? He had to go there on his own two feet, 80 kilometers, walking, dusty road, no chariot, no horse. He was walking. That's right. No MTR, Flora. No MTR. That's right. Walking. But then the Holy Spirit gave him a lift the rest of the way for those, for those other kilometers. And it could have been just to show there's the human effort, there's the supernatural side of things. It could have been to show the Holy Spirit's in charge. And may I say one other thing? It could have been just to show God loves us and sometimes He just does good things for us because He loves us. He really does. He loves you. Has God ever just blessed you with something and you felt like, well, Lord, where did that come from? I, didn't, I don't even think I deserve that, but you just did it. And He just does it. He shows His love for us. And as it ends, if you read chapter 9, which we won't because we're stopping here, it says that Philip kept on doing what he was doing. He goes up the coast and he preaches in all the towns, Lydda, Joppa, all of these towns and other towns that are not named, all the way up the coast until he arrives at Caesarea. We won't meet Philip again until Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. But you know what you will see in Acts chapter 9, the very next chapter? You will find that in Lydda there are some Christians. You will find that in Joppa 
there are some Christians. I wonder how that happened. I think it was Philip. I think it was Philip as he went. He was obedient and he was quickly obedient and he just did what God said to do. Whether it was by circumstances or supernatural guidance, we want to be that way too, don't we? So we close with prayer this morning. That was pretty fast, wasn't it? <laughs> Amen. Some of you are saying, Pastor Jennifer, if only you would always be that fast. <laughs> You're going to have to pray for a bigger miracle if you want it that fast <laughs> all the time. That, that, that requires fasting and prayer. But I want to pray for you in all seriousness. Um, as you come to a close, as we, as we close this morning, would you let the Holy Spirit, what's, what's the Holy Spirit saying specifically to you this morning? Is He talking to you about obedience? Is He talking to you about accepting His direction, whether it is through circumstances or through supernatural guidance? Is it to help you and refresh you in your commitment to Him in water baptism? That you need to be reminded that, oh, He set you free from the power of sin and you're living a new life? Is it to remind you of the joy of your salvation? Is it to prompt you that you've not yet been baptized in water, but you do believe and you need to be baptized? It's not me. It's what the Holy Spirit says to you this morning. Holy Spirit, we come before you. We present our hearts before you this morning. And we thank you that you included Philip in the Word of God for us, that we see this zealous, obedient brother that inspires us to be obedient as well and to be zealous for you. Lord, we want to be as obedient to you as Philip was. And Lord, we would so love to be part of your blessing for others, to bring your life to others. But Lord, also for ourselves, speak to our hearts about where we are in relation to you and to the commitment we made when we were baptized in water, that it may be fresh and new in our lives as well. And Lord, speak to those this morning who just need to obey and say, yes, I'll be baptized in water and receive joy and receive joy from obedience. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.